Okay, does anybody mind if we start five minutes early? Is that okay? Yeah, it looks like we're kind of full up anyway, right? And it looks like we got a good early start this morning. We had a lot of a break between Linda's talk and mine here. Um, so you're probably looking at this and saying, what the hell, what the hell, right? Leveraging technical friction in the organization, what's that all about? Um, I'm kind of known within the industry for basically writing this book a long time ago about working with legacy code, right? Anybody ever hear about this at all? Cool, okay. And it's always like this really mixed bag when I'm in the Agile community because there's so much that happens in the Agile community space which is really all about teamworks and people and kind of like how do we basically go and get all the process tweaks in place to go and do things. And in the back of my mind, I'm kind of like, yes, that's good and everything, but it's like I'm always thinking about the code for one reason or another. And I think it's because of my background as a developer, right? And um, it's quite striking that basically when you look at things from the perspective of the code base, they look quite, quite a bit different sometimes, right? And um, so what I've been doing for the last, I guess, 10 years or so, pretty much as I go around the world and help people with legacy code problems and stuff like this, is kind of like getting a sense of what the impact happens to be of the different organizational process decisions that we make upon the code base itself. And you might look at this and go and say, well, why would we care, right? Because the code is like this inanimate object that just kind of like sits off in the repository and only a couple, only a certain you know, uh, set of people ever have to go and look at this code, right? But the thing about it that's just really amazing is how much the quality of these artifacts that we have impacts so much within our businesses, right? So how many people have been in organizations where it takes longer to do things than you'd like, right? <laughs> wow, 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 that's amazing, right? So what special process is gonna fix this? Well, it has to be agile, of course, that's why we're here, right? But the thing is, we can do all this work to kind of like optimize ourselves, optimize our processes and stuff along those lines, but we have this incredible mirroring thing that goes on, right? In the sense that if we let these artifacts that we have deteriorate to a certain point, then it's kind of like no matter what we do, right, things are gonna be kind of hard and rough, rough going, that kind of thing. So have you ever heard of Conway's Law at all? We're gonna talk about this a little bit later. Some people have, some people haven't. We're gonna dig into it a little bit deeper, but there is, it seems, this deep mirroring process that happens between the technical things that we have, the technical artifacts, and then how we organize ourselves and what we do in process. And I feel that essentially, we don't really think enough about these particular things. And so what I wanna do, basically do in this you know, presentation is, well, first off, I apologize for the word leveraging there, because I'm not gonna show you how to do something specific, okay? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you how to see things a bit differently, see different forces at play within software development between the things that we create and us. And then, hopefully, as you understand more of these dynamics, they can inform a lot of the decision making you make within your organization, okay? So that's kind of where we're going with this. Um, I wanna go and start out with just like this thing, you know, we heard Linda Rising talk about mindset a little bit earlier. There's a bit of a different mindset to this talk. Has anybody ever run into this word before, isomorphism? Okay, yeah, and it's interesting, a couple of hands raised, but basically this is a term from graph theory, okay? So this is the scary slide. Everybody scared? Good deal, right? So we see graph theory here, you know, essentially this is, um, within mathematics, graph theory is basically the study of structure. Essentially you have things in the world and then you have the relationships between them. And it's very easy for mathematicians to model these things by going and using like these, they call them edges and vertices, right? And there's like well-developed theory about how things tie together in different ways. Well, it turns out that basically there are many things in the world that are isomorphic. And what this means is that when you diagram the system using a graph, it looks the same um, as another system that might be in a completely different realm, for instance. So I'll give you an example of this. Um, look at this graph here, okay? There are 1,700 entities in this graph. Are these teams or are they microservices? <laughs> Hopefully they're microservices. Yeah, but the interesting thing with this is kind of like it doesn't really, it doesn't, there's no real difference. I mean, well, I guess so. The, you know, microservices and teams are definitely different things. But what's kind of funny is that essentially when you graph things out, you can't even really tell, okay? Because there's kind of like this thing where you have hubbishness. You see those like orange circles there? 
those are things that basically have many, many in connections coming into them. And then you have things that are kind of like off to the edges. This same diagram could basically go ahead and document um, flight connections in a group of airports, right? There are certain structural things about the way things kind of knit together that basically sort of tend to recur across many, many different systems. And understanding things at this level, this very structural level, can help us make better decisions at work. And I'll show you a bit more about that later. So let's go ahead and take a look at a situation that occurred with a client I had a while back that um, uh, kind of highlights the structural reasoning that we can use, okay? There was this organization and they had a bunch of teams and um, one of the things that they basically wanted to do was basically do more acceptance testing because acceptance testing is good, right? No quibbles about this. But the thing is they kept looking around in the industry and trying to find a decent proprietary tool or open source framework to go in and actually do their testing. And they couldn't really find anything that was suitable for their work because it's kind of an oddball domain. Um, but what they did is they said, okay, well, each one of our teams is going to go and actually sort of like build its own little testing framework internally. And they just sort of like did that by default. And then, of course, what they kind of realized was that when they talked around and realized that each of these teams was doing this, they realized, oh, this is kind of rough. Maybe we should sort of like have one that everybody uses. So they went around, they basically figured out which one of the testing frameworks was really going to be kind of like a decent foundation for the work going forward. And they basically took it and put it into a separate repository. And it was kind of funny because it's there in the separate repository, but it started to go and kind of deteriorate in very odd ways. You know, people would just go there and whenever they needed some kind of change to the testing framework, they just like push a change into it and it would just go and get all this accumulated change over and over again. And um, when you kind of look, there were sometimes a couple people were working on it, sometimes nobody was working on it. It was kind of like this orphan project in a way that was kind of like hanging around in the center between these teams. When you looked at the code, right, it was kind of odd. They essentially had like this base class and an object-oriented framework. And you could basically see it just grew and it grew and it grew. People kept shoving things into this base class because they needed them for, needed those things for their particular project, right? Anybody surprised by this at all? It's funny because the longer you've been around in software development, the more you start to go and see these interesting, crazy dynamics about how you can see things in the code that mirror the organization, right? In fact, um, a famous consultant, Gerald Weinberg, he was like, actually worked on Project Mercury like way before Apollo back in the days of the 1960s. He used to go around as a management consultant and he'd say, in advance, he'd say basically send, send some of your code to me in advance of my engagement with you so I can diagnose your organization. He felt that through looking at the code, he could basically tell things about your organization. And it turns out it is somewhat true. So here's the thing with this. It's like, you know, we had this particular scenario. How do we solve this problem? And, you know, I guess the big thing with this is kind of like wondering, well, what is the problem really, right? Um, initially, we had this thing of going and saying that we need a testing framework. We found a way to go and kind of like work it out. So we're working off of a common one, but the code is deteriorating. Any ways that we can solve this problem at all? Yeah, it's kind of funny. We won't even get into how do we solve it right now, but let's go and look at the dynamics of this, though, first. Okay, instead of going and looking at how to solve the problem, let's go and talk about, you know, what are the forces at play within this? So have you ever seen this little cartoon here at all? This is kind of like a, a comics um, view of Conway's Law, right? Look at Amazon, okay? This is like an organization chart. And essentially what we're saying with Amazon is that Bezos' personality is such that he's gonna kind of like drive decisions down from the very top in a very hierarchical, federated way, right? Google, everybody is networked. Everybody can work on any project. They go back and forth, and it's like this incredible interconnection of people going back and forth and doing various different things. Facebook, you know, kind of like uh, not much of a hierarchy at all, very, very distributed. Uh, Microsoft, I guess it was the early days when everybody was hostile to each other, so they've got guns out pointing at everybody else, right? Um, is Apple self-explanatory there? <laughs> yeah, except, yeah, exactly, except he's gone, so who knows what it looks like now, right? But the notion that all these decisions are centered upon one person's, you know, uh, vision of things. And Oracle, basically, you can see the legal team is gigantic. And engineering is like this small little piece right there, right? But the joke with this, and it's kind of like everybody kind of gets the joke with this. The joke is really found based around something which is rather sublime that's been discovered about software development. And it's this, Conway's Law. And I asked right at the beginning of this talk how many people know about Conway's Law. And it's like, you know, it's, this to me is really the foundational law of software engineering, but not enough people really know about this. 
So back in 1968, believe it or not, he basically made this observation that essentially when you have, when you have separate teams in a development organization, the structure of what they produce is gonna end up mirroring the structure of the teams. And the old joke was if you have, if you have like four teams working on a compiler, you'll get a four pass compiler just because they'll segment the work out that way. Has anybody ever seen that kind of thing happen? You know, it's, it's a strange thing, it's a strange mirroring thing. And what's funny about it is like if you think a bit, you can kind of see what's going on with it and why it actually happens. The reason why is like, so let's imagine I'm working on something and you're working on something. I've got my team, you've got your team. It's kind of like I can't talk to you every day because you're in a separate team. So just by, without even conscious thought about it, we're gonna to start to develop ways in which my work can be separate from yours and there must be some interface between my work and your work. So just because of the communication barriers that we have within an organization, we're gonna go and end up going and producing structure that kind of mirrors those communication barriers. And so this seems to be a very deep, sublime truth about software development, that essentially the way we organize ourselves has effects on the technical structure that we produce. Now the thing about this is that sometimes when people hear about Conway's Law, they're kind of like, oh my God, we're doomed, you know? Because it's kind of like they kind of know how hard it is to change their organization. And it's like, okay, well, I guess we've got our architecture then. There's not much that can be done about it. But there's a far more optimistic view, which is that essentially if we're aware of these dynamics, then we can actually actively change parts of our organization in order to achieve desired technical effects for the stuff that we're working on. Way more optimistic view, right? Depending upon your organization, right, and what you're capable of. So there's this thing that code and team structure kind of are isomorphic in a way. And it's, what I'm gonna basically say with this is not that they are always isomorphic, but in the cases where, there aren't, where they aren't, there's tension there. And that tension is something we have to go and deal with in the context of process. And um, a lot of the things we do in Agile you know, are very, very useful things, but I think there's this way in which we, we if we don't recognize that we have to do things to counter some of these forces, we might go and work at cross purposes with some of them. So we're gonna dig into these things a little bit deeper here. And may know what this is. It's like a curve of a power law distribution. Okay, have you ever heard of power law distributions? Okay, it's an interesting thing. There's something called, you ever hear of the Pareto Principle? It's kind of like, um, like uh, the last 20% is gonna take 80% of the time, right? And it's like, it's a funny thing. There's like this curve that shows up in all kinds of natural and human systems where this kind of dynamic occurs. This actually happens with like income as well. There's usually like a small number of people that have lots and lots of money. There's like a, when you look at, um, if you look at like Starbucks, how much market share do you think Starbucks has compared to all the other coffee shops, right? If you look on a per coffee shop basis, they have like a huge, huge amount, but there still is this long tail since so you'll hear about long, you'll hear about long tail distributions of like lots and lots and lots of independent coffee shops, right? So this kind of dynamic happens over and over again in systems, and um, you might be surprised to go and hear that this happens in software systems also. So, for instance, the size of methods in your code base follows a Pareto distribution also. So most all of your methods are going to be like two or three lines of code and you'll have a couple that are like, you know, 50 or 100 or 1,000, God forbid, right? But you'll have some that are like that. So we have like this kind of distribution here. And it's like the reasons why this kind of occur in many different systems are probably a bit too deep to get into here in the context of an hour, but it's some, something you should really be aware of in, system, in uh, the context of systems. Um, and so this is kind of interesting. If we are aware of this dynamic, that basically things tend to follow this Pareto distribution, and I encourage you to read more about it, then we can actually go and work at cross purposes in some ways. So anybody enjoy complexity in software? Great, nobody, yay, we're in the right place, okay. So maybe we should have metrics in place to go and kind of bound the complexity that we have on our code, right? So you have complexity numbers and you're saying, you know, no method in our system should have more than, say, a, a complexity score of 12. Good idea? Yeah, the only thing about that though is like when you realize that the distribution, like in nature in a way, for methods is really kind of like Pareto distributed like this. It's kind of like, you end up doing this thing of kind of like artificially cohering things in bad ways. So you can end up with distortion. Anybody ever see like, if you look at like an oscilloscope and like you see like a natural, you know, signal. If you hear like a, a trumpet 
It's like this natural like sine wave, right? It's like it peaks and valleys and they're nice and curvy. You know when the top is chopped off in the bottom here? That's distortion. Like hearing like this really distorted guitar, it hurts your ears a bit and stuff like that. So how does distortion manifest in the code base? Well, I'll tell you a story about this. Um, years ago, I was going and visiting this team and their code was, you know, the methods seemed nice and short and they were kind of, you know, they kind of ticked all the boxes in terms of like good structure and stuff like that. But I was looking at the code and I felt this thing of like, maybe the developers have mental problems, right? Mental problems, <laughs> cognitive problems. Maybe they have this thing where they don't quite understand things. And the reason why I said this, which is not the first thing anybody wants to go and think about anybody, right? Is that it's like the names of the methods didn't really match what they were doing. And I'm kind of like, what is this? Why is this kind of weird like this? So of course, I've got this mystery in my head and I didn't really want to talk to anybody about it. I'm like, Okay, mystery in my head, let me look around for clues, look around for clues. And um, I finally came into a team room and saw that they had this big poster of the team rules and they said, you know, no method should have more than 15 lines of code, right? And I'm like, ah, oh, that's it. That's exactly it. So as they were structuring their code, they were like, oh, okay, we've hit 15 lines, time to break this into smaller pieces. And the thing is, you can either break it in a way where it works well with the natural structure of the computation or break it artificially, and then how do you name these artificial chunks? You know, you come up with a name, you try to, and then the name isn't quite fitting well. And there's this dissonance between the naming and the thing that you've got, right? I mentioned complexity earlier, and it's like, yes, the same thing can happen when you say, whenever we reach a certain limit in our complexity scores, things are gonna kind of get weird, and it's time for us to go and break things down, right? So this thing of appreciating that there are certain distributions that happen like this, and you know, hard limits aren't always gonna help you. you know, you're better off sometimes going and saying, you know, let's go and pay attention to the way that the things kinda of wanna be, and then work with them in order to sort of bolster them up in a cool way. So that was a very code-centric example. Let's go and move on to some other things. Anybody know what a coding hero is? Yeah, are they good or bad? Doesn't somebody want a hero to come in and save the day? I mean, my God, you know, it's like you've got, all these crazy problems, we need heroes to fix things, right? Well, no, the thing is in the Agile movement, one of the things we've been very, very strong on is trying to go and set things up so we can make everything as, um, as egalitarian as possible. We want everybody's input in order to go and solve problems. And we want to be able to sort of like, you know, raise everybody up and do all these good things. And it's great because, you know, there's always that person who's sitting in the back of the room who, you know, doesn't speak up very often, but probably has brilliant ideas. Right, and you know, when their contribution is heard, then everything works out very well. So we have this ethos around this. And so for the most part, we've kind of like demonized the person who kind of comes in and says, well, we can fix this, 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 and this. And you know, that can be kind of rough. So this is a very, a word which really has a lot of baggage associated with it. So it's kind of odd about this because I came across this paper in April of this year. Um, and it of course used this term heroes and of course, I feel like I got a bit of thick skin, so I didn't like immediately dismiss it. I actually read the paper, and I saw online that everybody's like, no, we don't need heroes. Heroes are toxic, it's terrible. Why are they you know, using this word? I think it was just to get attention, which is really kind of sad. But the research itself is very interesting. What they pointed out is by going and doing analysis of like over 1,000 projects on GitHub, they found out that in like 90% of these projects, um, contribution on these projects followed a Pareto distribution, okay? Now what I mean by this is going back to the picture again, it's like you have a small number of people, 20% of the people on the project contributed 80% of the effort, okay? Now this is not just making the commits, it's also all the conversation that was happening online around what to do and all these other things. And so that's kind of a funny thing. Does anybody see, I mean there's a couple of different, a couple of different ways of reasoning about this and saying well, um, how does this sort of thing happen? Um, one is to go and say those are meanies who basically are trying to sort of thwart other people's you know, contribution. The other is basically saying the people who just actually get way, way more involved um, are gonna continue to get involved because they are, they already kind of know the stuff, so having them work on it makes a little bit more sense. The paper was even more explicit about something else, um, pointing out that essentially the quality of those 20% um, committers uh, or contributors was much higher, fewer defects and everything along those lines. 
So it's kind of a strange thing with this, because you know, one of the objections was to say, well, th this is only open source projects. But I know people who do repository analysis in, um, in organizations, and it seems to be true as well. So the question is with this, what do we do with this? It's like information to go and actually help our development. It's kind of funny, right? Um, I would argue that we are, we're already doing it a bit, okay? Um, I think we kind of recognize that there's diminishing returns to having too many people on a project. Is that true? Yeah, the more people we add, there's more communication paths and stuff like this. Maybe we should focus on having smaller teams, right? Now you have at Amazon, they have the two pizza team thing and that sort of thing, right? Um, and you know, if you have like a smaller number of people, then there's more direct communication, less chance of things being misunderstood or playing telephone going across to different people and stuff along those lines, right? But the thing is, you know, with this kind of like an empirical background with this, you know, maybe we should sort of start to reconsider certain things as well, right? Um, so I, I think that the thing with this to go and point out and the dynamic of this I'm trying to get across is that there are limits to what we can hold in our head all at once. And because of that, that goes and sort of like changes the structure of the stuff that we're working on. And we need these things to be in tandem because there's limits on what we can do, each individual person. And there's also limits on how we can aggregate ourselves to go and do certain things. Paying attention to those limits really will basically bring us benefits when we're thinking about process and organization, stuff along these lines. Anybody ever hear of Dunbar's number at all? Okay, there's like a researcher, Robin Dunbar, a sociologist, and he basically made the observation based upon seeing what was happening in an organization that human beings can only really maintain contact with about 100 people. Past about 100 people or so, it's kind of like you lose track of faces and names. So as an organization grows past 100 people, then it's kind of like the entire dynamic and structuring is gonna to have to change because you know, it's kind of like you know, you're, you're, not able to go and, uh, you're not able to maintain these close-knit relationships. Anybody had an organization go past that transition point? Less than 100 and over 100, and then suddenly it's like things have changed. You kind of need more intermediaries. You need various different structures in order to go and actually achieve the same effects that you want to go and have in the future. So again, these are part of the things we have to go and basically factor into, you know, process and organization. Um, I'm just going to skip that just because it's not a thing with this. I want to go back to software here. Um, class diagram, okay? Uh, anybody know the single responsibility principle? Anybody who's been involved in software development? Okay. This is an interesting thing to consider as well, is it seems like you can't have a class grow beyond a certain point before you start noticing that there are separate groupings of responsibility inside of it. For those of you who are developers, you kind of have that same, you've seen that kind of thing happen, right? Isn't it kind of true in organizations as well when you have like a clique? Like you have a soccer team and basically as more people grow in the team, people form their own little small subgroups of people they hang around with, right? As organizations grow, you start forming substructures. And that tends to be true both within code and also within, uh, within social groups and stuff like that. So this isomorphism, this mirroring that basically as organizations grow, you're gonna need smaller pieces. And also as software grows, you're gonna need smaller pieces. So that's just like modularity, right? And um, yeah, so there's a reason for modularity. Modularity happens both at the organizational level and also happens at the, you know, the software level. Um, but it's kind of funny about this, though, because part of the, um, one of the things that we think about a bit today is like, do we really need to have like compartmentalization inside of organizations, right? Like, hey, you're your own team, work on this. You're your own team, work on this, right? We need a lot of cross communication across teams to go and do various things. Good idea? We need it quite often, but the thing to recognize is that it actually does have a bit of a cost also, right? We can use technological things to kind of like, kind of like massage away certain problems, but they don't ever really go away immediately. Does anybody use Slack here at all? Yay, do you love it or hate it? Yeah, mixed feelings, right? I have mixed feelings about it also. I think with Slack, it basically allows you to have many, many wide conversations across an organization. But then you can also be in the space of like, oh my God, there's so many conversations I need to be part of. And then you're kind of like spending a lot of time going and dealing with the increased communication load of doing these kinds of dealing with, you know, what's going on over here versus over here versus over here, how does this impact my work and all that kind of thing too, right? So it does seem to me at least that if we were able to compartmentalize things a lot more in terms of structuring our teamwork and stuff like that, 
then you, know, you can probably just take the ball and run with it in many different cases and do various different things. But that requires us thinking about problems a bit differently to really get that kind of compartmentalization. I guess the main thing I'm saying is that essentially that kind of communication overhead isn't free. And because it isn't free, you know, we end up being in some strange spaces sometimes. Um, so it's kind of funny, this thing of things breaking down into smaller substructures happens all across nature too. You ever look at cell division? Cell gets to be too big, break it apart into pieces. I'm arguing that essentially these dynamics are true across most every system. Not just software systems, but also organizational systems as well. So same kind of thing. Um, so let's look at teams again. Anybody ever do component teams and feature teams? You know about this terminology, right? Which one's better? Nobody's gonna answer, nobody's gonna take the bait, right? Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Okay, it's an interesting thing with this though because when I first you know, introduced the concept of like component teams and feature teams, I thought, hey, very interesting concept but I can kind of see where it might fall apart. The, um, the reasoning that was given to me was that essentially traditionally within software development, we've had a strong focus on having component teams and their entire purpose is to go and say, I am part of the database team. I understand everything about the database. And then somebody else is part of the, you know, part of the front end team that understands everything about the front end, right? We still have that front end, back end schism, you know, in development. But this thing of saying that we have separate teams who basically have separate specialties and we do all these things, right? Downside of this is that the features that are coming in might not all require equal work from all these different things. If that's the case, well then what do you do when you're, you know, there's nothing to do in this sprint? Or you refactor, right? And you can refactor and make things better and stuff like this. So the thought was, why don't we basically set things up so that everybody can do a bit of everything, right? And if everybody can do a bit of everything, then things will get much better, right? Um, when people first started doing this, I started thinking, okay, well, there's gonna be a problem with that. I'm not really sure if people see it yet or not. The problem is something that economists call tragedy of the commons. Have you heard about this at all? It's like this economic observation that like if you have a park in the center of a city and nobody really feels like they own it at all, then it's kind of like, well, yes, I'm gonna walk through it. I'm gonna basically leave trash and stuff like this because it's not my park, right? It's kind of like, you know, that'll be somebody else's problem when we do things there. It's like, it's the same thing with like um, consuming resources. It's like, well, it doesn't hurt me if basically I eat all the fish because, well, I've had all the fish, right? And don't really care about other people not having fish, right? So when you have something which is held in common by many people and there's no real sense of ownership to the things, then things can start to deteriorate. And so I've seen that kind of thing happen with code and it's not a malicious thing at all, but you can have like, you know, you have a giant, giant repository, everybody's kind of working on it. And then you have this thing where it's kind of like your team kind of works in different areas of the code base at different times all the time. And maybe you don't know enough about this context. And it's extra work for you to go and ask somebody who knows a bit more than you, so you do your best. And this is a very different dynamic than if you kind of owned that component and could basically go in there and sort of like say, well, yeah, I understand this because I've been working on it for five years. I'm surrounded by people who've been working on this for five years also, right? So again, not malicious, but this is a thing that can kind of happen with us, that things can start to deteriorate. Is there any way to mitigate that at all? You can have people who tend those particular areas of code, and it's like you must put your changes through them in order to go and sort of get them approved and stuff like this. So here's the thing, I'm not gonna go and say, hey, component teams are better than feature teams or vice versa. But the thing I think is important is to understand the dynamic behind these things. And the dynamic is really one of understanding that code doesn't really exist by itself as like just this artifact that's out there and you know, nothing really impacts it. The way that we structure ourselves and the way we interact over time with code bases basically changes, you know, change their structure for good or for bad, right? And if we're aware of those dynamics, then we can go and change our structuring based upon these things. So actually, having a rather hybrid approach to this sort of thing is kind of nice. You have some teams that are dedicated to particular key areas of the code base that are business critical, and then other parts of the code base you can say, yes, let's go and rotate people around these particular things, right? So we get more benefit of knowledge in other areas. So it's kind of like tending a relationship between the code and between the organization and recognizing that the code needs a seat at the table, right? So this, this is really like a real hobby horse topic of mine in a sense, is that you know, we don't really think about the impacts on the code as much as we should. Quite often it's like we're thinking about features, 
we're thinking about the teams that we have, and we're thinking about different you know, goals within the organization and stuff like that. But the impacts that we have on the code eventually come right back to us, and that's kind of, kind of awkward, right? It's terrible to dig yourself in a hole and not even be aware that you're doing it. And there's an industry standard term for this. What's this industry standard term for the hole we dig ourselves into? Legacy code or technical debt. Yeah, technical debt, right? Okay, so just to talk about a couple of things since we're kind of in the center of this, okay, you know, there's a large amount of work that we need to do. Effectiveness of teams um, decreases, with, or, um, decreases with size. Siloing is kind of bad, having like component teams that don't interact with other people. Teams can grow stale. Unattended go, code grows stale. We can only handle so many things. There's all these dynamics, but they all come down to this thing of like our attention. Where is our attention on the systems that we're working on, right? And we can't have our attention become too diffuse, and there's a problem with making it so focused that we don't see anything else outside of it. So most everything that we basically do in terms of designing process and designing organizations has to basically be, it has to take into account these tensions, these tensions of having things which are too diffuse, or too att uh, diffuse attention, or basically having you know, attention that's so focused that it misses other things. So there's this interesting question that comes up from some of these things, some of these things I've been reading about and digging into, is that can we become way more progressive, excuse me, productive by scaling down? And um, I think it's a very interesting question to consider. Um, imagine this little equation. I'm using a little bit of math here. So we have the team, which is the people that we have, the tools that we have, and we also have the code. And you can almost like quantify these things a bit and sort of say, you know, there ought to be some scaling factor. It's like, you know, um, some number that we multiply times the number of people we have on the team, the number of tools that we use, and the amount of code that we have. And maybe it should all be less than n, right? So you don't want to basically have way too many people, and you don't want to have, like, way too much code, and you don't want to have way too many tools in play. The number of tools that you have to interact with day to day basically is a cognitive load on you, right? So it seems like because we have cognitive limits on the things that we're working on, it's kind of nice to go and say, you know, let's try to go and keep, keep it small to some degree. Keep some kind of focus in the, um, the teams that we have and the, basically the scope of their interactions with the code and with other parts of the organization. And, you know, I think that there's a possibility of becoming hyperproductive with that. Um, but then we become cyborgs if you take the root case. I am one person that writes a small amount of code with one tool. I'm hyperproductive, but, you know, when you look at what's actually done is kind of small, and then you end up looking like this, and that's more and more, right? So maybe there's a sweet spot with it. Um, there's a great blog called Powers of Two by a guy I know, Ben Rady. And um, he, uh, he wrote this up in 2017, but he was talking about his experiences in an organization working on a tool that they use internally. And I can't really say very much about the domain of this, but essentially he was talking about how much process disappears when you have two-person teams. And it was kind of amazing to think about it, right? So two developers, they come in every morning, they pair program on everything, and their customer's right across the room, and they basically talk to that customer day to day. They don't have a backlog, they just decide in the morning what they're gonna work on based upon feedback from the customer. And essentially the production support, they basically go and sort of trade it off. It isn't a 24-hour available system, so they have that kind of thing going for them. Um, testing, it's like, yeah, they'll write the tests as they go along with things. Um, they work just on the main, on the trunk, you know, in software development. They don't, uh, you know, have any kind of branching at all. They use inversion control because just two people. And it's like just kind of amazing they're able to get away without doing very much at all because they've kind of streamlined things by going and making things very small. And, you know, it's kind of funny. It's like more code better or is less code better in software development? You know, we keep writing more and more code, but if we can solve the same problems and basically make more money using less code, by all means, we should try to do that sort of thing, right? I think in all of the mania that we have for scaling within the industry, sometimes we kind of forget to challenge it a bit and go and say, you know, maybe we can try to go and basically not scale sometimes. And there are very small companies that basically do very well by going and having only a couple of developers and, you know, merging the technical and business decision making and doing various different things like that. And they kind of decide not to scale, right? Now, for us in Agile, we are quite often we're tackling the harder problem, which is kind of like, we're already part of big organizations. Organizations are trying to get bigger. Well, that, they're trying to get bigger, they're trying to get more market share, and as a result, you tend to want to go and have more developers and more testers and more QA people and stuff like this, right? 
But anyway, it's powerful to go and actually think about challenging this a bit, just because of the dynamics of attention, just because of the cognitive limits that we tend to go and have. And then, you know, it's like if you can't scale certain things down, then you have to figure out what are the mitigating things we're going to go and do with this sort of thing, right? So if you have, you know, if you're working in an area of code and you kind of discover that um, people are making changes to it that didn't really know much about it and things are falling and deteriorating, you can put something in to go and say, look, we are going to basically review everything that goes in this particular area of the code. It's a fine thing to do, and it's great. The thing about it to recognize is that's, it's the reason you would be doing that as a process step is to go and basically deal as a mitigating factor against the thing that you don't have the team and the code being isomorphic anymore. The team and the code are kind of like separating a bit. The, the relationship between team and code is breaking, and that's why you're having to do something special in that case. So, you know, I bring a lot of this stuff up because, you know, um, the Spotify model is great. I think we have somebody from Spotify speaking later today, right? And um, I have great respect for it, but I think we are still on the stage in the industry where what we're doing is we're taking things that have been shown to work someplace and transplanting them within our organizations, which is great. But what I'd really love to see is I'd love to see us basically thinking in terms of these dynamics enough to be able to go and say, okay, well, I can design my own organization and process, you know, pair to go and basically meet the particular needs that we have in an organization. And the way that that works is by, like I said, understanding the dynamics of these things. You know, this is tuned to a particular sweet spot that we have within um, the industry right now, and that's great. But, you know, you're gonna have variations, and you know, you can design your organization and your process, just like you design your so software. We don't really have to cargo cult it. Yeah. I wanna bring up this guy, because I've, um, as I've been digging into this thing of trying to go and sort of like figure out how to get people to think in these terms, um, I keep running into this guy. His name is Bruno Latour, a French sociologist, and he studied um, how science works as a sociologist. And he came up with something called actor network theory. And um, it's kind of radical in the sense that he uses diagramming in order to go and kind of like show the relationships between things and people within organizations. And it seems kind of strange from the point of view of a sociologist. It's like, you know, isn't sociology all about people? But he would go and say, look, you know, it's really about our relationships with the things in our environment as well. Um, early extreme programming was kind of very uh, prescriptive about certain things. You should have a team room. Everybody should sit together, right? And anybody remember CRC cards? You ever hear about this at all? It's like the first case tool for uh, in agile software development, or the first planning tool, was index cards. You write on index cards the stories and you communicate back and forth. And there's a particular affordance to going and actually like looking eye to eye with somebody and trading cards on a table and stuff like this. Produces a particular dynamic within the team and also in terms of the planning and stuff like this. We've kind of like moved away from that sort of stuff a little bit, but from like the actor network theory point of view, all these things basically have effects within our system. Anything we do over here can affect something over here to some minuscule degree. And this is really a deep, deep level of design, right? It's like we are not just designing software that we put out into the world. You know, the organization that we design as well. I mean, you can say that our organization, our team, and our process, and our structure is a design task. And it's probably one of the most important design tasks because it is consequential for everything that we produce going forward in, in the, the industry. Um, but I don't, you know, it's something we need to go and basically place more emphasis on. And they heard of this book at all. Okay, it's a classic, right? Fred Brooks, The Mythical Man Month. Um, he made this uh, uh, observation that's been called Brooks' Law. And back then, the biggest problem with software development was that things were late all the time, right? And, you know, still happens quite a bit, depending on how you schedule things and what you're doing. Um, but he made the observation that adding people to a late project makes it later. Does this kind of ring true in a way? And again, it's because of that whole cognitive loading thing. You get people coming off the project, it's gonna take time for them to come up to speed. Because of this, it's gonna go and slow things down a bit. What if the same thing is true about um, tools? Adding more tools to a project, does that make things slower? If there's a ramp up time and time, so, you know, all these particular pieces, the tools, the code that we have, us, we're in a network together. And understanding the dynamics of this network is kind of powerful. I'd argue that adding tools late in a software development project can be disruptive in much the same way as adding people. And it's not because people and tools are the same, th same thing, but it's because this dynamic of effect really kind of plays out in much the same way. 
Let's go back to that example I showed a bit earlier. We had that testing app, and um, we're pulling things into the center to go and make this framework and stuff. Um, we had that crazy base class that has all these particular pieces. Um, and then we have, you know, we have like this, you know, the, the little graph there is basically showing the, the, the personnel working on this particular part of the framework. It, people come and go as they need to go make little modifications of this particular thing. Um, so we have a testing app in the center. You know, what can we do to go and basically solve this dynamic based upon what we know about, you know, the forces involved in software development? It turns out we have a lot of different things we can basically use as levers in order to go and actually start to make this situation a bit better. Um, one of them is to go and basically sort of like create a separate team around the testing framework, right? So their entire full-time job is to work on the testing framework. Does that help things? It can, but then you also have this communication barrier of like, hey, can you put this in for me? And it's like, well, we'll put it in our queue. You know, maybe we can't do it this iteration, but we'll do it next, right? So we can have a separate team, but there's a trade-off in doing that sort of thing. Another thing is to go and say explicit interfaces. Why don't we go and actually say, instead of having that base class that has like the code that we plug into it all the time, we'll just make a plug-in architecture so it's very easy for people to go and add in the things that they need and doesn't really require coordination in the central code base for that. That's a solution too, right? You can do that. What about going and saying, well, I'm tired of having that separate framework for my team. I'm gonna pull that whole thing in and maintain it myself. Fork it so that basically I can use my own copy and then I don't have to communicate with other teams to do things. Does that work okay? See, no, no one of these is a solution to the entire thing, but the thing is, I think if you start looking at things in terms of di these dynamics, then you're really in a generative space to go and say, it's not about me going and shopping solutions, it's about me seeing a problem, and then imagining what kinds of solutions we can basically apply to the dynamics that we happen to have within the context of what we're doing, right? So, yeah, I'm not gonna go and tell you any one of these is a better solution than another. So much of that is really contextual. But we have lots and lots of options in this design space once we see the forces involved in the trade-offs in, in these kinds of things. So the way it worked out with that team I was working with is that essentially um, they had separate teams that incorporated things and they had other people that basically sort of put things in the center and uh, you know, um, ended up using that framework across, you know, shared across a couple of different teams. So it's like a mixed solution to that. You know, as I'm kind of like, um, you know, coasting down towards the end with this. The thing I want to go and point out as well is that essentially we don't really appreciate as much as we should just how much team and code are the same thing at a phenomenological level, right? That essentially it's like code that doesn't have people associated with it deteriorates. And it's not like the code itself falls apart, but our ability to go and actually change it and do things um, goes and completely falls apart. And I think it would probably be nice for us to actually think of the code team system as one thing in some way. If we had a good word for it, it'd be great. Um, Jessica Keir, anybody know her at all? She's come up, or she's borrowed a term called semathesy from Nora, Nora Bateson. Nobody can spell it though. Right? Yeah, but I'd love to have a term that basically means the code team system and basically what it means for that thing to be healthy. Because it definitely isn't just the code and it definitely isn't just the people. Um, one experience I had years ago was going to a company. I visited them in their home offices and did consulting later with one of the teams they offshored to. And I went to that team, I won't mention what country it was, and I'm there and I said, can somebody explain the system to me? And they said, well, we only saw it last week. So millions and millions of lines of code dropped in their lap with no handoff and with no communication about what this thing does and no easy way to go and get that information. How can that work, right? That comes down to basically going and losing the fact that this is true, okay? Um, how many people can you lose on a team before you lose the integral knowledge that's necessary to keep things together. It depends, right? But the thing is, you wanna have some sense. There has to be some continuity of knowledge on a team. And if you're not aware of that dynamic, then things you know, kind of fall apart, right? It's great to basically go and move from team to team and re-team and all these different things, and that's good. I think what we need to do, though, is basically understand that that knowledge transfer and knowing where that knowledge resides and all that stuff is the integral part, that's the lifeblood of the entire software development effort. So anyway, so I just want to kind of end up here, okay, and just sort of like, you know, open this up for questions. There are lots of forces, you know, in the world in software development, and it's time, I think, for us to go and actually think about what these forces happen to be so we can leverage them, and we should be able to go and talk about these things. I can't claim to you that I have the answers for all of these things. It's really more like I'm pointing in a direction and saying, 
you know, I gave you a list of the different forces that we have in the context of our software development. If we talk about these things a bit more directly, then we can further align ourselves with them. Um, you know, aligning yourself with the forces that are around you is a pretty decent, you know, way of going and sort of leveraging things, right? So, you know, this canyon, right? It's like it's been eroded by millions of years of rainfall and everything else and stuff like that. Um, can't walk from one side to the center because of all that stuff, right? You need to know what the terrain is. And these forces really are the train of these things. So anyway, at this point, I want to kind of like open it up for questions, comments. And uh, sound good? OK, thank you. <laughs> so we ended a bit early. Any questions or comments at all about this? Yes. Okay, so the question, because of you know, miking up and stuff like this, like, do I know of a field that's basically gone through similar issues and stuff like this? I don't really know. You know, the things that seems like other engineering efforts really should, you know, particularly like, you know, hardware engineering and stuff like that that's done across distributed scales. It's worth looking into, but I haven't really done enough looking into that. Um, I think w the interesting thing about software development is it really is very large scale coordinated activity, and that happens in many different areas. Um, but it's the thing which makes us different is we are coordinated activity among people with artifacts in the center that we're working on in, in concert. I think Alistair Coburn back in the day said that software development is like community poetry writing in a way, which is kind of an interesting way of looking at it. Um, but yeah, I'm sure there are parallels we can find from other disciplines. I just haven't thought about it enough. So. Other thoughts, questions? Yeah. Yeah. But um, in the company I work for, we have the build teams and the run team concept, and so we try to do a good handoff to the run team, but you know, what's the last team? The run? Run. Run team. So yeah. Run. Okay, got it. Yeah. And so, like, based on what you said, do you have a suggestion on how we can uh, organize your team so that you can increase the knowledge with? Yeah, yeah, very interesting. So the question to repeat because of miking up and everything like that is that essentially she's saying in her organization they basically have like build teams and run teams and essentially there's a handoff that happens between them. Do I have any advice about how to go and deal with the handoff and stuff like this? You know, the, the thing about it is I, I really come from, sometimes you'll see in philosophy people talk about descriptive versus normative. Descriptive says I'm, let's understand the way things are and normative is like, hey, what do we do about it, right? You know, I can offer different suggestions around that, but there are trade-offs across all these different things. One of them is to basically go and get the run team involved early on, having some representatives of the run team be along during the build so that the knowledge transfer starts to go and happen early, right? And this is, again, it's all about going and maintaining some, uh, maintaining some co coherence between the people and the, or the artifact that's kind of going along with things. That's one possibility with it. You know, what you're doing, you know, I'm sure it works, you know, but it works maybe not as ideally. It depends on what you want to go and trade off with things, right? Um, so that's a possibility. Okay, sure. Yes? Is there any program that you can put the program in from the company that you're going to see, and you can suddenly see what their structure is, so you can intuit what the company structure is from the code base, like you talked about? Um, yeah, so the question is, are there any tools which allow you to basically put the code base in so you can intuit what the organizational issues are and stuff like this? There's a bunch of different tools around. There's Code scene by Emprayer, and I have an affiliation with them. I have to be, you know, uh, disclose that I'm on their advisory board. There's others um, like uh, Code Climate, I guess. Um, various different that, that space of basically having tools to basically go and do a, a, a complexity assessment and stuff like that. Yeah, I, there are a couple of different tools in that space. I think Code Climate and Code Scene are a couple of the ones like that, and they have they vary in levels of their support for going and doing that kind of analysis on things. Um, you can actually get pretty far by going into sort of like, you know, looking at the committers, you know, in, in, a, in a code base. And, and you know, where are the committers organizationally? And how do the committers line up with the work that's kind of coming in? Sometimes you'll look at things like this and kind of discover that it's like, you know, outside the organizational structure, there's like a group of people that basically sort of like do some cross-organizational work within the code base that um, isn't really apparent to everybody but may have value. You know, there's lots of things you can do in that space. But I think we're still at the beginning of this doing this kind of analysis across organizations and you know, factoring it into our work. I will say that I, I believe like you know, Google and Facebook do like 
very extensive work in that in their spaces, but they probably can consider it competitive um, and don't really put out as much as they could. But it's an intuition. Yes. So uh, the topic of documentation always comes up whenever uh, the department starts talking about moving an app to a different team or mm -hmm. changing a bunch of the team members on an existing app team. And so like there's this, there's this whole area of like you know, uh, travel knowledge or like you know, idea leaks and a lot of other ideas and take where it's like all completely documented, right? But it's like it's always kind of difficult to find a sweet spot because there's never enough documentation and it takes a lot of time to make the documentation that doesn't stay up to date, right? Mm -hmm. Great, so let me go and reiterate the question. You're basically saying, what's the, what about the question of documentation? Essentially, when we transfer code from one team to another, you know, if the documentation is poor, you know, and if we, it's never as good as having tribal knowledge, but then if the tribal knowledge breaks down, we're in trouble, got it. One of the things I think that's interesting is like to, when you start to notice things like that Pareto team distribution thing I talked about a little bit earlier, it makes you kind of wonder about certain things and start to go and basically um, think about some underlying assumptions we've made over the years in the industry. Um, in Fred Brooks' Mythical Man Month, he talked about something which would sound so bizarre to us we wouldn't even consider it. He talked about something called the Chief Surgeon Programmer Team, which was basically something that's like pioneered by Harlan Mills back in IBM back in like the, the 60s or 70s. And the idea was there, it's like the best systems look like they came from one mind, so let's have like a lead programmer, like the chief surgeon in an operating theater, and an assistant in case something goes wrong, like he or she dies, right? And then basically have like a toolsmith and a language lawyer and a QA person around this person to go and kind of like make sure everything works out well. And this was actually adopted for quite a while in the early parts of the industry. Um, but it seems so antithetical to what we would do right now, right? I don't think we should ever go back to something like that. I think that basically growing everybody to go and do equal things is good and you know, like skill development and everything like this. But I do notice that when the numbers are telling us that our team should be smaller, then maybe we're getting not as much benefit from getting, having extra developers as we might think. And that leads us up to going and thinking about, well, can we use people in different roles? So I was talking to somebody at this company a while back, and they have two-person developer teams. And they said, you know, it's just kind of rough for us to record all the decisions we make. We'd love to have a history, like a documented history. Too much work. And I said, well, you know, what about, what about if in the industry we had, like, project archivist as, like, a role? So a person with exquisite communication skills and technical knowledge, and their job is to go around to the developers every day, every couple of days, or just sit over their shoulders and record what decisions they made. And not just record these decisions, but also be able to sort of like index them in ways that they're easily understood by people that come later within the system. And uh, that there's some way of going and organizing the knowledge so that basically when, you know, if you did have to transfer things over, it's kind of like, you know, we have the full project history here. We're gonna tell you why the decisions were made from the point that the code base was this small to where it is like this. You know, one of the interesting things that's a tragedy in our, soft, in our industry is that code lives longer than we do, in a way, right? You can say it's tragedy, but it's kind of like, at that point, it becomes unmanageable because we don't understand it anymore. And then we're like in this terrible legacy nightmare thing of like, oh, work is miserable because I can't understand what I'm working on, and nobody understands, all the people are gone, and you know, there's a lot of code around that's like that. But you know, we, you know, if we recognize that maybe adding more developers isn't the answer, Maybe adding people that have the skills to go and build up that body of knowledge and documentation is. You know, that's a possibility. So, so other thoughts or questions at all? Yeah. So I heard you say, like, the size of organization can impact how we organize. So I was like, the code structure and the yeah. bigger or smaller or whatnot. Is there any other factor that can be triggered to, okay, now it's time to rethink how we structure the code? Yeah, so the question is, like I mentioned, size of organization as a, um, a trigger towards going and causing structural change within the organization. And it's just the one I'm thinking about quite a bit more than others now. I think a lot of it is market reactivity, too. And it's like there's, there's other things in your competitive landscape and your regulatory landscape that might ca cause you to go and sort of, you know, make these changes. You know, one of the things I think is kind of fascinating is that some organizations will grow support staff, you know, at a very large level without necessarily recognizing that maybe that's a side effect, the need of that, to do that is a side effect of other decisions they've made. Um, so yeah, I think these are all reactive to an environment. Um, I think, you know, but the point you make about basically size of the organization impacting the structuring that we have, it's like, yeah, we, should be, we shouldn't be surprised when we have to reorg all the time as we grow, so yeah. Other questions, comments? Yeah. 
<laughs> How do you have the code a seat at the table? Yeah, I've been playing around with different ideas around this, and I think there's a couple of different things. One is during um, retrospectives, feel very comfortable talking about the technical choices that you made and talking about whether you feel good about the changes that you've made within, within the code. Sometimes I think developers basically have this thing of like they don't bring those things up because they're scared of boring the business people that are in attendance. Um, but it's like actually I think it's very important for people to, um, uh, to basically recognize that level of work and recognize all the decisions that are made at that level and kind of like recognize the reality of the code. Another thing as well, which is kind of um, two other things. One thing that's kind of goofy but fun, I encourage you to do this with your teams, is when you get together, periodically do this thing where you're doing role playing. Like, okay, I am the gateway. It's like, well, I am kind of like, I am the, co the computation engine. And have people go and say, well, you know, I feel kind of bad because in the last sprint I had all these changes that were made and nobody could really clean up after things, right? So anthropomorphizing the code base in meetings is actually kind of a fun thing to do and uh, interesting. A third thing, which I think is kind of powerful and interesting, is um, to make sure that in planning, people recognize the reality of the technical systems. And there's this practice called quality views. It was written up by Colin Brecht. Um, I'll put that up on the screen here. There's a great talk he gave at a conference in London like two years ago. And the idea behind this is to go and say, let's have a very simple diagram of the structure, the architecture. It doesn't have to be a very high fidelity, but when you're doing planning, just basically have the boxes in this diagram colored from like say yellow to bright red depending upon the health of the, of the, the code or the system, right? And so then when somebody goes and says, well, you know, we've got this particular feature and it's kind of like, uh, you know, we want this feature and you say, yes, well, that's great because this one basically touches these two components and this one's very healthy. This one's got a little bit less health, but it's still pretty good. Not gonna cost you very much. Oh, this other feature, we want this other feature. Well, that's gonna cost you a bit more time because you notice that you know, it touches these three components. This one over here is not quite so healthy. We need to do more work in this area. And you don't even have to go and sort of like have the conversation be that explicit. Just showing the diagram and basically making that sure that's on the wall and you refer to it periodically. The people you interact with in business will start to go and recognize that the decisions they make about features and when have impacts on the um, system. And the dynamic that he talks about, which is great, is that without even mentioning technical debt, eventually you start getting your stakeholders to go and say to you, that area's getting redder and redder, what can we do about it? We know it's impacting us. And then you're like, well, yeah, we can take some time and work on this and this and this and this. You know, we've done, I think one of my reluctance, my, one of my regrets about Agile, and I've been there since the very beginning, is that essentially the code quality technical thing has been kind of a little bit under the table in a sense. It's very easy for developers to go and talk to the business without without basically having the realities of the systems underneath basically sort of exposed in a transparent way. And it hurts everybody, you know, eventually. So, yeah. Yes? Yeah, I've seen, I've seen places where they do it well. Um, it's, yeah, there's so many different strategies. I think what's funny is I don't think there's any one particular strategy that's like way better than the others, right? Um, but yeah, it's a lot of it's just like cutting out code and creating separate services and stuff like that and being very uh, deliberate about, uh, you know, what pieces you're gonna basically extract first. Um, but that's not, really my, that's not really my bread and butter in terms of what I do in the industry. I definitely recommend Sam Newman, you know, his book, books and the consulting work he does. Um, I think he's got a new book coming out now and it's, He's probably spent more time cross-organization in the microservice space than anybody else I know. So it's definitely looking into him as a, a lead for this. So. There's also a really good book called Working Effectively with Legacy Code. And you might want to <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that problem is solved, right? We don't have any more legacy code. Um, well, <laughs> One more, or two? Okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm working on a second edition of the Legacy Code book. It's moving along, and it's really just kind of like um, adding things that we've learned in the last 15 years, because it's been about 15 years now. So there's that. 
So look forward next year. Okay. Yeah. That's such a wide question. Organizations that buck the trends. Um, yeah, I, 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 the 80 20 thing is relatively new to me, so I can't really analyze based upon that. Um, yeah, nothing I can really speak to right now. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think people are, I, I may be overplaying the whole thing about feature teams being rough. I think with enough coordination, you can sort of make organizational decisions about where you need to apply effort. Um, so a lot of these things may not be as deterministic from structure as I'm kind of like, you know, talking about. You know, I think this is like the default mode and there's, because this is the default mode, you can do all sorts of things to try to bolster to basically make, other, make many things work, right? I think one of my things is to go and say it's like, you know, um, airplanes don't negate gravity, right? They basically make it manageable. So this is more about gravity than airplanes. So, okay, thanks. Thank you all.